Well, good evening. If you would take our hymnals tonight, turn to hymn number 413. We'll sing that first verse again. Sound the battle cry. Let's stand as we sing. Pastoria Baptist Church. We're excited about tonight. Been a great conference already. Looking forward to what the Lord's going to do tonight in our midst. Well, tonight I experienced a first service. Sometimes I have greetings. People smile, nod at me, you know, from down there to up here right before the service starts. Just as the service was started, something happened to me that's never happened before. There was a little boy out in the foyer. He blew me a kiss. Actually, I think he was blowing it to his mom. I intercepted it. It was what it was what, but... I never had somebody do that from the foyer to the pulpit. And I'm sitting here like, whoa, okay, blew us a kiss. That's a, hey, greet the brethren with a kiss. Holy kiss, right? So anyway, I'm glad he's glad to be here. I hope you are too, amen. And uh, we're looking forward to what the Lord has in store. Let's pray and ask his blessing on our time together. Father, we are so very grateful, so very thankful for the blessings of the conference that we've enjoyed thus far. Thank you for meeting with us. And Father, thank you for teaching us and growing us and challenging us. Thank you for the good preaching that Brother Levesque has brought and what you've laid on his heart, how your Holy Spirit has used him, Father. We're thankful for that. The good fellowship we've had, too, before and after the services, we're thankful for that. And Lord, as we've gathered tonight together here again, we pray that you'd just give us a great time in your house. Would you show up? Would you make your presence evident and, Lord, work? in every heart and soul and life and father i just pray we'd uh, we'd eat it up and father we would just take all that we could out of our time here and lord through the song service the preaching of your word may you just be in all of it and may you gain the glory from it now bless father it's in christ's precious name we pray amen you may be seated Short and Christ's return draws nearer every day. The world and the wicked lost their all doth quickly pass away. Let us be walking circumspectly, not as fools but wise, fixing our thoughts on our Lord's
would take your hymnals again, turn to hymn number 404. We're going to sing The Fight Is On. We'll sing all three verses of this. If we're going to sing about The Fight Is On, we're going to stand and sing. Hymn number 404. Oh. singing this evening throughout the conference. Appreciate your participation in that way. I'm thankful for that. Let me remind you of a few announcements, a few extras tonight. So I hope you'll listen up and I'd like to encourage you about some things upcoming, especially as we look towards the summer and things. But first of all, just remind you tonight's last opportunity to give towards the love offering for the Levex. and appreciate their ministry this week. And so we want to be a huge blessing to them. So I encourage you to give tonight and an offering plate. And we'd like to be a much uh, big blessing to them in many ways in that way. Let me encourage you also the FBA play coming up on the 26th and 27th a little bit over two weeks away and uh, tickets are available in the office I'd encourage you to grab those plan on joining us one of those two uh, either evening or afternoon one of those two days and there will also be a grab and go bake sale which occur after the uh, presentations for the senior trip and for our senior class they don't do many fundraisers so that's one of the few the senior trip do so or the seniors do for their trip so I encourage you to uh, come on out and bring some food grab and go bake sale after those presentations of the, uh, the play I encourage you about that back in the back we have the table set up it's actually around the corner by the track rack and uh, for visitation tomorrow at 10 saturday at 10 if you can't make it out of those times you can grab a visit make it when it's convenient for you i'd remind you we have several wild game dinner we'll have more out there wild game dinner follow-ups and so those, those are easy to grab have a survey attached if you'd like to use that and talking to them and kind of is a nice segue to sharing the gospel as you knock on their door and do a little bit of follow-up and uh, i'll tell you right now i've done several of those the wild game dinner follow-up and i'll i'll tell you they, they're one of the easiest
easiest ways to, to do a, a door-to-door because they, they typically have come. They've already been here. You're talking about something they attended, and, and I've never heard a bad word about the Wild Game Dinner, so that helps, right? And uh, I've never heard I got poisoned or anything like that, so that's good, amen? And, uh, and uh, nobody complained about the prizes or anything, so it's always been good. And so uh, it's, a, it's an easy way then to get to the gospel and just share it with them and talk about what they heard that night. So I encourage you, grab those or come on out to visitation. It'll be a great time to reach out and opportunity to do so. Next Friday, Training Little Hearts. Ladies, encourage you to get on board with that. There's a sign-up back on the Welcome Center, especially for young mothers and things there. Uh, but it's back on the Welcome Center next Friday, 9.15 to 11.15. And so next Training Little Hearts. And so it'll be a blessing to you. Encourage a good fellowship and it's just a good time together as ladies. And so I encourage you to sign up for that too. Hard to believe, but let me go ahead and start putting in a plug for Vacation Bible School. In just a couple of weeks, uh, we'll have out some slips for volunteers for different parts of Vacation Bible School. And appreciate it so very much. Brother John Yeomans is going to kind of head up Vacation Bible School. He and I were able to meet today and continue some of the planning and things there. And so getting excited about that. Maybe I have kind of an extra month because it's in July. And uh, so we'll get that volunteer sheet out. If you'd be thinking about, praying about where you'd like to serve, I encourage you to do that. Uh, we're going to use a regular Baptist Press curriculum this year. So kind of switching it up a little bit too there. And so we're excited about that. And we'll say more about it. Hope you can plan on serving and ministering that way. And then I'll Obviously, at the end of that week, we have our Friends of Fostoria Family Film Fair. Amen. That's a lot of Fs, right? We always say that. A lot of Fs, okay? Friends of Fostoria Family Fun Fair are outreach during the summer into our community, and, and I hope you can plan on working that Saturday, too. going to be a great time. Then uh, one other thing about the summers I want to mention, too, and especially now that we have the teenagers in here, the youth group's not meeting tonight, everybody's together. Let me just encourage you about our missions trips upcoming and uh, impact points. Turn them in and finish the year strong. And and teenagers, you don't want to miss these trips, and we're excited about it. The B Missions trip, that's for our 7th through 9th grade. They're going to be heading out at the end of July, and they're going to be heading over to Orangeville, Canada. Okay, Orangeville, Canada. I hope you like orange juice. No, just kidding. Anyway, Orangeville, Canada. I think it's near Toronto, a little bit close to Toronto, about four hours away from here. They're going to be helping a church planner there, and they're going to be doing several things within the church, some canvassing. They're going to be doing a, a one-day vacation Bible school in a local park. They're going to be blitzing the area with flyers and things like that, the ministering in the church on the Sunday, so it's going to be a great time, great opportunity to minister, and a little taste, church planning, missions work, and so that's for our 7th through ninth graders who have earned the points, the impact points to, uh, to do it. So if you don't know where your, your teenager is on impact points, I'd encourage you to encourage them to get them. This is how they're, they, they show themselves faithful through the year earning impact points from the normal things of devotions, attending church, things like that, come to visitation, different things. And if they earn those points and they are eligible to go on that trip, they can do so. Church covers the cost, and it's a great opportunity. Our A missions trip, this is our 10th through 12th grade. They will be going down to El Paso, Texas. They'll be helping Bearing Precious Seed. And uh, they have, much like they do in Milford, Ohio, they'll have a place down there. They'll be assembling Bibles. They'll be going over into Mexico to hand out some of those Bibles, and they'll also be going to a non Navajo Indian Reservation and uh, ministering there too and so forth and so just going to be a, a, a very broad trip for our uh, 10th through 12th graders and that's happening at the end of June and uh, exciting uh, opportunity and uh, for our teenagers and so I encourage you get in those impact points if you have questions okay this is Pastor Tony to my left and to your right and see him he's gotten it all coordinated he and I spent some time today going through everything and playing it and so forth and so I'm excited I get excited when we talk about it I wish I could go on all of them and do all of them too right and uh, so I, you don't want to miss it great opportunity teenagers you don't want to look back in high, when you get out of high school and regret not going on the opportunities of mission trips I just encourage you don't want to do that okay you don't want to have those regrets as adults when you have the opportunity everything came together for it and church took care of it you don't want to have those regrets so work hard through the year earn those impact points and get them turned in all right I encourage you to do that and then in august we are tentatively planning an adult construction mission trip uh, to Senegal for josh and julie mead and to help in the new building the phases there and things like that and so we're looking into august kind of the middle we'll get some dates out we're going to get some prices on tickets and things like that so you you'll know, and it'll be for men and ladies alike, and uh, uh, there might be some need for some specialties, but most of it's just basic con construction or working things to, to work on the, the new um, projects there taking place and the new center and things there, and so we'll give you more details about that, but you can start thinking about that and planning accordingly if you'd like to go on that missions trip in August. So there's an opportunity for everybody. We'd love for you to go and uh, participate in missions when those are available. And then probably the, the, the most favorite announcement for at least the children here 
here. Just reminder for FBA students, 9 o'clock starts still tomorrow, one more day, okay? Then Friday, you have to come at normal time, nice and early, 8.30, okay? And so, anyway, don't forget that. That's one more day of that. I encourage you that. Tonight is Wednesday. We typically do our prayer time and announcements. We're not doing that tonight because of the conference. But let me just remind you of some prayer requests uh, and also share with you some. Um, Brother Vernon Cooper may, did make it home. Today's his birthday, too. So if you want to send him a text, uh, isn't that right? Today's his birthday? Yeah, today's his birthday, 88, I think. And uh, so I might want to wish him a happy birthday. But pray for him. He is home and uh, seems to be doing pretty good. And so just continue to pray that he'd be able to do it. And you know, I think they have someone staying with them all the time right now, family members. So grateful for that. Just pray for him to continue to make progress gain strength from that hip surgery and uh, that that would not be a burden on Miss Connie and things there. So pray for Brother Vern. And then I ask you to pray especially for Brother Jerry Hubble. Miss Pearl um, has taken a turn the last few days. She's not eating. She's not drinking. They, they put her on some pain management medication and uh, she's, she's not really awake at all. So would you just pray? And uh, obviously our prayers now with Brother Jerry as it is his prayer. Lord would just take her home and uh, she's ready. He's ready. We're just ready. We know that that's the best place for her uh, to be whole and complete and free from the, the limitations of this body and her sickness here. So would you pray for Miss Pearl and then pray for Brother Jerry and uh, the days ahead as the Lord calls her home. That they would have much comfort, the children, and uh, the Lord would just bless them. So pray for Jerry and Pearl Hubble. And then also we'd mentioned earlier Brother Dave White's surgery. He is still having it, but not tomorrow. It got moved to next Monday. So please pray for Brother Dave White. Open heart surgery, uh, triple bypass surgery is what that is. So pray that that goes well, but it has been moved to Monday instead of tomorrow. So please remember that in your prayers. All right, let's grab our hymn book. We're going to get to sing again. Hymn number 375, a great one. Great reminder, he gave his life for us. What have we given to him? Brother Dave comes to lead us. Let's stand as we sing hymn number 375. We'll sing the first, third, and last verses. I gave my life. Father, we thank you so much for this day, Lord. We're grateful to be here once again tonight, Lord, as we uh, are on our final day of our revival meetings here. And I pray that you would speak to our hearts, Lord, as we open up your word in just a few moments, Lord. Help us to be sensitive uh, to what you have for us here tonight, Lord. Help us to end uh, the, these meetings on a good note. Lord, help us to uh, remember, Lord, and to be impacted by what we hear and what we've been taught and preached to here this week. I do thank you very much for the ministry of the Levacs, Lord. I pray that you would continue to be with them in, in their travels and their ministry, Lord. And the Lord just continue to bless them in a great way. Lord, we do want to pray for these requests that were mentioned. Uh, Lord, we do want to continue to pray for Brother Vern, Lord. I pray that you would continue to give him uh, strength day by day. Lord, help him to be able to get the uh, complete mobility that he's uh, uh, hoping to have there. And Lord, we'd also pray for uh, Jerry Hubble. He's a... Uh, he's, uh, uh, having to deal with uh, um, the the uh, the her wife there, Pearl, and uh, just all the things that are going on there. And Lord, we just ask that you would 
uh, be in that situation. We know it's difficult to have to go through something like that and uh, just the decline of, of your wife, Lord, and we just pray that that you would uh, take her home, Lord, if it be your will. And, Lord, whatever whatever you do, we know it's your perfect will, and we just ask that you would uh, just bring comfort in that situation there. Lord, we do also ask that you would be with Brother Dave White, Lord, and his uh, surgery, Lord, being postponed, Lord, and we do pray that you would just continue to be with him and calm his nerves as he uh, uh, is going to be having that surgery on Monday, Lord. We just pray that you would uh, be with the surgeons, Lord, and pray that that would be a successful surgery. Lord, we do ask that it would be a quick recovery there afterwards. We pray that you bless the offering, Lord, use it in a great way. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You be seated.
lost he came to save. For me his precious blood he shed, for me his life he gave. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died, and that he died for me. All right, thank you for that, man. Appreciate that. We have had such a great time with you this week. You've had good crowds every single night, and uh, you've been wonderful to preach to, very easy uh, folks to preach to, and I feel like I've hammered on you a little bit, but that means you like preaching, and you come back the next night. That's fantastic. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 11. Children, feel free to be dismissed to go do what you need to do. We have talked a little bit about... uh, the things that Pastor wanted me to come this spring and stir us up on, and that is the foundations of culture. The Bible teaches us about liberty, about marriage, about education, being in dark days, modern Babylon, if you will. We need to serve Christ with an excellent spirit. And then last night we talked about the soon coming of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ and how things are heating up and how we need to make sure that we're striving for purity, striving for evangelism, making sure that we have oil Uh, in our lamps, and so appreciate those things. Uh, Tonight I want to talk to you about resurrection power. I have several books out on the table out there. I don't know what they're marked as, but all the books this size are going to be $10, (laughs) and the smaller ones are five, and and the one uh, transformation uh, is $15. And so I I kind of preached from the Bible, and I brought stuff out from each one of those publications, uh, and so if you want to look at that, that's what those are, and I'll be kind of mentioning things from Resurrection Power. My wife's got three different Bible study books, ladies' Bible study books. They're called Sweeter Than Honey Ladies' Bible Study. They're all King James Version. This one is Abiding in the Vine. How much is this? Ten bucks. Okay, so those are out on the table. I'm going to leave these up here for the pastor or whoever's first come, first serve. I'll put those right there uh, for gifts. Thank you for the getting to use the Prophet's Chamber Sunday for all the hospitality. I've met some guests. I've met a lot of you. I told the pastor up here, it's always a privilege to go and be in different churches and um, having a pastor's heart. Um, you don't know how much we love you. <laughs> you don't know how much we love you. We preach hard at you like we would preach at our kids because we love you. And so it's a joy to come and to love more of the saints of God. And thank you for loving us back. We appreciate that. And uh, we're oftentimes, we'll have to go up north and preach some Sunday. If we're coming back on a Sunday night, I'm going to come here, Pastor Henry, preach and get some more of this good choir and orchestra. Thank you, staff and musicians, for everything this week. We really have had a great time. The weather's been so good, we've driven in every night, and it's been spectacular, rolling farmland out here, and just great weather. I've had the window down and uh, my hair blowing uh, in the wind, and um, it's been a great time. And then preaching to you, I've really felt your excellent spirit, and the, the Lord God, the Holy Ghost uh, in our midst. So I pray that you've been stirred up and have been encouraged. And uh, tonight I really want to encourage you in the, in the concept of the resurrection power. Now, we just had our Resurrection Sunday, right? And you just preached on that truth. Do you believe that, uh, that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin? He said it's finished on the cross, right? I mean, he planned it, and he executed it, and he did it, and he said it's done. And then he rose from the dead. He raised himself from the dead, not just so that we'd be forgiven, so that we would have everlasting life, right? We say that when we identify in baptism. It's not our salvation, but it's an identification of dying with him and rising with him and living with him. And I wrote this book on the resurrection um, because, you know, Paul said that I may know him and the power of of his resurrection. What does that mean? I mean, I'm not God. I can't resurrect myself. How do, I, how do I feel and sense the power of the resurrection? I feel the power of the resurrection. I sing about the power of the resurrection. My heart is lifted. My mind is comforted. Uh, but, but how do I feel the power of the resurrection? As I meditate upon that, there's been times in my life in ministry that I've had to call upon it. 
And I think God has given me a taste of the power of the resurrection and then being able to study it in the Word of God, put it down in book form, and then preach it all over the country is exciting. And so as I beat you down a little bit, beat you up like a good coach would do, I want to lift you up tonight and I want to share with you resurrection power. How do you live risen? Resurrected lives are as attractive and repelling as Jesus' life was himself. Jesus said, they're going to hate you like they hated me. They're going to persecute you like they persecuted me. They're going to misunderstand you. They're going to talk about you. It's the same way they did me. They're going to do you. And the reason why people look at you and us this way and act that certain way, and we feel that sometimes, is because we have resurrection power. It's invisible. It's like a cosmic, supernatural, spiritual energy. I'm not talking Benny Hinn. Forget that guy. Amen? But I'm talking something real here. John chapter 11, verse 1. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus. You know the story. Of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary, which, it was that Mary which appointed the Lord, uh, excuse me, anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had therefore uh, when he heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that, saith he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. His disciples saying to him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and thou goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in a day? In the day, any man, if any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth. But I go that thou may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his what? Okay, Lazarus was dead. Let's just make that real clear right now, okay? Lazarus had died. Jesus used the term sleepeth because he was going to illustrate uh, the power of this light. But I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Uh, excuse me, verse, uh, uh, then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, to the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. They thought Jesus was going to die as he went back into Judea. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. I mean, Lazarus was dead. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off, and many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now it's obvious by the great detail that the Apostle John writes concerning this account that the build-up to the actual raising of Lazarus was very important and very meaningful. It is important that we understand that. Jesus did love Lazarus. Perhaps that is why he used this grand display of resurrection power. It may seem cruel to some, but Jesus and Lazarus are forever put together as loving friends and resurrected lives. It is a designed operation with hand-picked characters. Mary and Martha may have felt forgotten by Jesus, but they too were part of the story. Verse 20, then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me... Though he were dead, yet shall he live. Remember last night I was doing the words of Jesus, Jesus about himself, the words in red? Here he is again. Jesus is giving his own autobiography in the Gospel of John. And he says, I'm the resurrection and the life. 
Do you believe in me? If you believe in me, even if you die, you can live. That's a pretty bold statement, man. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come unto the world. You know what's amazing? He received that from her. It's one of the proofs of Jesus' deity. He didn't say, like many of uh, the prophets and apostles or many of the angels would say, when people fell down to worship him, they'd say, no, no, stand up, don't worship me. I'm a man like you. I'm just an angel, right? You don't receive worship if you're not God. And yet here, she receives the declaration that he is God, and she worships him, and he receives that. Hallelujah. That's one of the great proofs of Scripture. He preaches who he is. She accepts who he is. She worships who he is, and he receives it. Glory. Amen. Great example for us. Martha did believe that even after Lazarus had died, that Jesus could resurrect him. She wanted more than the general and future resurrection on the last day. Jesus poked into her soul to see if she truly believed he could do what she was asking. Ultimately, she made an incredible declaration. She declared Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God. What faith she displayed even before Lazarus was raised. That is how Christians should operate today. We should believe in this resurrection power. Believing and declaring that they are indeed in the capable and life-raising hands of of Jesus the Christ. Now Mary, the other sister, was not so sure. <laughs> and when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary her sister secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house and comforted her, uh, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled and said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus what? Jesus wept. Now, didn't, didn't he know that Lazarus was going to die? Didn't he hold the disciples back for days? Didn't, didn't he know that he was going to raise them from the dead? And yet he wept. Beloved, Jesus loves us. He knows all about our human condition. He knows all about this, this plan. And yet he loves us. And yet he, he wept for Lazarus. Glory. Oh, the compassion Jesus had for Lazarus. And for Mary, it was evident in his tears and somber cries. The crowd even witnessed it and commented on it, even though Jesus knew what he was about to do. And even though he knew the reality of Lazarus' resurrected life was about to be fully realized, he, he still wept. The Lord is full of compassion for us all in our dead and human state. That is why he came to earth as a man and lived among such sinners. He braved pain and thirst and accusation and, yes, death itself. He became like us so that we could become like him. That is the point. Lazarus becomes synonymous with Jesus and resurrection life, not in his own power or by his own goodness, but by the power of Christ alone. The narrative continues to build with Jesus' amazing prayer to God the Father, once again showing the powerful proximity of heaven and the nearness of the spiritual realm. Heaven's not way out there at shouting distance. Spiritual realm is right here a whisper away. Beloved, we're swimming in it. And we need, to become, we need to realize that we are spirits. We have a body, we have a soul, but we, we are spirits as well. We know our bodies and we know our souls because we know what we think and what we feel. But most of us aren't very much alive to our spirit. We don't sense our spirit. We don't feel our spirit. We don't know how to touch it. And yet the Bible says, be strong in the spirit. You see, a mature Christian will... Grow in the Spirit and exercise the Spirit and pray in faith and do what they're supposed to do and challenge themselves and be on their knees and their face at the altar every time they have opportunity. Feed on the Word of God and grow in the Spirit. And when that happens, you know what? Your spirit starts to tell your soul and the mind of your thoughts, quiet, be still, know that I am God. Your spirit, as it grows strong, will sometimes Comfort your heart and say, quit ye weeping, quit ye worrying, 
Amen? Jesus will then take over and then tell your body, hey, your steps are going to be ordered the way I tell you to order them. Hallelujah. This is a spiritual man and woman. Beloved, you are a spirit. Start acting like it. Grow up. and Realize what you are. and Be strong in the spirit so that you can be strong in your soul, pleasing God, and you can be obedient in the flesh. Ooh. Verse 37, and some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus therefore again, groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus said unto her, saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. Lazarus would have been just fine without resurrection. Let me say that again. Lazarus would have been just fine without resurrection. Our dear brothers and sisters in Christ that have gone on before us are just fine. His eternal life was already secure, but Jesus wanted those present to see beyond the veil of time into the realm of eternity, so the miracle was to be done openly for all to see. Verse 43, And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound with a napkin. Jesus saith unto him, Loose him and let him go. Lazarus arose! He arose! He was dead! He he was stinking! Four days in the grave! Jesus loved him and wept over him. He had encountered death, but he arose. He was abound from the grave, unbound from the grave clothes and let go. His sisters must have shrieked with delight. The crowd must have audibly gasped, then cheered. He's alive. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Imagine a manly embrace between friends. Lazarus may have believed in Jesus before, but now there was no denying it. His eyes would have pierced into Jesus' own gaze. The silent understanding was even greater than the crowd's cheers. Lazarus now knew that in reality he would never die. He was alive forevermore. They determined to kill him. Excuse me. Lazarus, he had tasted death and spit it out of his mouth. Isn't that great? Can you imagine him taking away the grave clothes and spitting death out of his mouth? Life was never so sweet. The rest of John chapter 11 shows us that this was the final straw for the unbelieving Jews that were there. Jesus could no longer be seen in public without risk of arrest and crucifixion. But he already knew that. His business was, and his final business, was to resurrect and make such a thing possible for all who would believe. They determined to kill him and decreed that anyone who knew his whereabouts should tell them immediately. Lazarus was also to soon be on the fugitive list. As badly as the religious Jews wanted to table and uh, take and kill Jesus, they earnestly sought out Lazarus as well. Why was this? Lazarus was a first-hand witness to the power of Jesus and his own trip to the afterlife. Lazarus could tell the true account of death, everlasting life after death, and even more dangerous to the chief priests, the reality of a resurrection life perspective. While many flocked to hear the amazing insights of Jesus and Lazarus, about how they should live their lives, angry religious leaders raged over the very same supernatural accounts. John 12, verse 9. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake, but that they might see, get this, Lazarus also. Jesus was the main attraction, But they came that they might see Lazarus also. He had not gone to Texas and come back. Amen. He had had gone to death, Hades, and back. And the stories were spectacular. 
But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to what? They wanted to put Jesus to death, and now they wanted to put this one who had spit death out of his mouth and had resurrection power, they wanted to put him to death. Because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. You see, when we live out, when our countenance shows, when our spirit is excellent, you see, I, I, I know you might think I'm a little bit off, but one thing is for sure, you, I, I know that you think that I believe in what I'm saying. And you got to get past that line in your life to where you go and say, I'm not really concerned what everybody thinks. I want them to believe what I'm saying. And in fact, they don't have to know my name and they don't even really have to like it. They just have to consider what I'm saying is true. And that's why you're saying it. And that's one of the essence of resurrection power. The Bible tells us that Jesus himself was nothing to behold physically. He wasn't GQ's man of the year. He wasn't Joe Wider, you know. That's kind of old. I'm kind of aging myself there. It seems surprising that the one whose spiritual countenance is like radiant fire and sparkling as gemstones could appear as ordinary as any human. Isaiah 53, 2, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He came to ransom the common man, so why not represent the average Joe? If he was not ten foot, perhaps he was five or six. The beauty of Jesus was not in his earthly visage, but in his spiritual man, in his spiritual holiness. The Bible calls it the beauty of holiness. Psalm 29, 2, give unto the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. This is why some things you come and you take earthly things away from church and they help you in your earthly life. But you never quite come to church the spiritual man and take the spiritual things and go live the spiritual life. And this is the essence of what revival is, to take you beyond just the cold cup of water that church can be and take you to the fiery energy that it can be in your soul and, and you can take home and you can live a magnificent life. I'm not talking about the, the showmanship and, and, and the faux aspects of the charismatic movement. They've got nothing on us. They'll, they'll, they'll stand as charlatans one day. Nevertheless, here, Jesus attracted great crowds. They were attracted to his message about the coming kingdom of God, his miracles, and his love for even the downtrodden sinner. In equal measure, the religious leaders were jealous of his popularity. They must have thought, how can this normal laborer, a Galilean even, upstage us with his messianic rantings? Lazarus must have been attracted to Jesus, for he hosted the Lord at his Bethany home with his sisters on several occasions. The scripture records the public understanding that Jesus loved Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha, and that they in turn loved him. John 11, verse 2 and 5, we read, it was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair whose brother Lazarus was sick. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. This love was based upon eternal and spiritual things, not physical or earthly characteristics. After Lazarus' resurrection, he fully shared in this type of attractiveness. His newfound beauty, the beauty of holiness, and increased love for Jesus would have been based upon the new and truer vision of Jesus as the bright and glorious King of Kings. No earthly religious leaders would quiet Lazarus's praise-filled testimony, testimony, or like Moses' shining countenance before the Lord, veil his own resurrection shine. There's something different about that guy, Lazarus. An irresistible excellence emitted forth from his resurrection body. He had the same attractive qualities of intrigue and the same repelling qualities of conviction that Jesus himself had put forth. Born-again believers in Jesus Christ have been raised to walk in newness of life. 
That means that they believe in life across the veil of death as deeply as Lazarus did. They live daily with a sure hope and expectation that they have the very power of everlasting life within themselves. Why wait to live gleefully like Lazarus did when such an all-encompassing reality of the ownership of everlasting life is had within oneself? You see, you don't have everlasting life when you die. You have everlasting life today. You have it right now. We are spiritual and everlasting beings bought by the blood of Christ encompassed about by the Spirit of God now. And the Word of God is not just English letters printed on Indian paper with gold trimming wrapped in calf skin. It's not just a thing. It is the living voice of God. I believe in the living voice of God. I go to it every day as though I'm listening to Him. That's the resurrection power had by you and I on a daily basis. Why wait to live gleefully like Lazarus did when such an all-encompassing reality of the ownership of everlasting life is had within itself? It will create both a glorious attractiveness from others who want to know about it and an odious repelling from those who want to reject it all. It'll put you in both positions. Matthew 5, verse 11, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Verse 44, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitely use you and persecute you. That can only happen when you, are, when you have resurrection power flowing inside of you. Luke 21, 12, but before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. John 15, 20, remember the word that I sent unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Romans 12, 14, bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. What gives you this supernatural perspective, attitude, and ability to love even your enemies as they're throwing stones at you? Even Stephen said, forgive them. Amen. Forgive them. And I tell you, it's resurrection power. We've looked at just one instance in the Bible of someone who was resurrected from the dead. Do you know there's 10 instances in the Bible of people being resurrected from the dead? There's a whole lot of studies of resurrection power in people who saw death, came back, and lived differently. The widow of Zarephath's son. Remember Elijah? Remember that great miracle? The Shunammite woman's son. Remember Elisha? <laughs> Do you know the Jews say that when Elijah raised that boy, uh, the Zarephath, the woman of Zarephath's son, that they had already experienced the miracles of Elijah. So they already had the word of God and they believed it. And then, but then now they experienced death and they, they experienced resurrection power. And so now their testimony was so powerful that Ahaz and Jezebel, Ahab and Jezebel had to do something about it. And in the, in the Jews' writings, and they're pretty compelling writings, I got to say, you know, uh, did the Japanese bomb Pearl, Harbor, bomb Pearl Harbor or not? I mean, it's not in the Bible, but it happened, right? Huh. And so some of the Jews' history writings really are heavy into why Zarephath's son was actually Elisha. And when Elisha went... And Elisha said, he said, I got, I got to go bury my parents. He said, let the dead bury the dead. We preach on that, but Elisha knew what that meant. And uh, remember the funeral corpse that was thrown in on top of Elisha's bones? They, they saw the enemies over there. They saw the, I think they were Syrians or Syrians. And they threw in the bones and they ran. And as, they, as the enemy came over to the hole that they seen the people threw something in, up up climbs this guy that was dead five minutes ago. And all of a sudden, he's not afraid of his enemies. All of a sudden, he's like, you guys sit down, let me tell you what just happened to me. I mean, his life was different, amen? Imagine those boys risen from the dead, how they talked about God. How they, with confidence, talked about heaven in the New Testament, they're the widow of Nain's son, Jairus' daughter. 
There's the Jerusalem saints on the Feast of First Fruits. Remember that? Jesus rose from the dead. And uh, on the Feast of First Fruits, people would take their, their basket and they would go to get ceremonial first fruits out of the fields. But as you left the city and the gates and the walls of the city, you immediately walked through the graveyards. Any of you been to Jerusalem? What are right outside the gates, surrounded by graves. And they would walk through the graveyards out to the fields where they were going to reap the harvest. And so here it was, uh, first fruits. And, and as the women were experiencing Jesus in the garden, people were going out at first light to go and kind of ceremoniously get the first fruits. But they saw, they saw people out in the graveyard. <laughs> I don't know if there were people that had just died. I don't know how many people they were. But they were like, isn't that Uncle Henry out there? Wasn't, didn't we have that funeral last Tuesday? And, you know, I don't know what the stories are, but they were experienced. They must have thought it was a zombie apocalypse. <laughs> you know? But on the first fruits, the people rose from the dead. God was giving us a taste. He was giving us a sign of what really was going on. Remember Tabitha? Dorcas? I had uh, Bob Jones University was calling and recruiting me to come to, to Bible college. And the gal that was recruiting me, her name was Dorcas. And I, and I was listening, I was 17, and I didn't know that was in the Bible at that point in time. And I thought, I ain't going there if they name their girls Dorcas. <laughs> and so that's why I chose Pensacola. It was real spiritual. <laughs> it was real spiritual. I, I don't know if I made the right decision or not, but I, but I met my dear bride. Amen. Her name's Amy. Hallelujah. What about Eutychus? Eutychus rose from the dead. Beloved, the Bible is filled with this Old and New Testament. Apostles, prophets, Jesus showing us that this, this ethereal area is, is right there, but that we have power over it. We don't really see it. We can't really feel it bodily. We can think about it a little bit, but it's only when we strengthen our spirit that we become cognizant of it. Have you ever walked into an arena where you thought, there's evil here? That's not just a thought. That's not just a feeling. That's your spirit warning you. You ever got in a situation where you thought, listen, right now you could be tempted this way or you could say no. And your spirit started telling your, telling your will, don't do it. Go, go the other way. Go the other way. Go the other way. And your will said, feet, turn. See, that's, that's spiritual living. That's resurrection power taking place uh, in your life. But that doesn't have to be a small thing. You know, we always say, be still and know that I am God. We have to turn down the volume of the world in order to sometimes hear the voice of God. But it's good, listen, that you come to church and get waylaid by the word of God, what, six times in a row here <laughs> already. Because, because what? Because you're tuning in to the voice of God. You're tuning into the spiritual realm. You're strengthening the spiritual man inside of you. And you're getting yourself ready to go the right way. And so I, I finish, beloved, this, this uh, week of meetings by sharing with you this resurrection power. It's not something you wait for. It's something that you have. If you're under the blood of Jesus and you have the Spirit of God, preacher, am I allowed to step off the platform? Do you do that sometimes? Okay, well. I've been in trouble. But I still do it. <laughs> okay. Here's a nice little pocket knife. I have a lot of manly, manly knives that I wear. But on Sundays, I usually have a nice little girl knife. <laughs> that's, a nice little, that's, a nice, that's a nice little knife. Doc Green given me several knives. Every time you go, you used to go preach for Doc Green, he'd give you a, a nice knife. I've got several of these. And on Sundays, I usually keep one of these in, in my pocket so that I can, you know, clean my fingernails, cut an apple, you know, whatever, whatever it is I need to do. I'm just kidding. Come on, folks, lighten up here. <laughs> but let's say that, uh, let's say this represents that very element that God sees and knows that you are under the blood that you have the Holy Ghost, that you've been bought with a price, and that you're His. I have this element, and so someday, Trump is going to sound, amen? And the voice of the archangel, and those with the element will have resurrection power and translate and change in the twinkling 
of an eye. And those that don't have the element, like the foolish virgins that we talked about, they'll be left behind. Some of our beloved we're talking about that are saved, they're on death's door, but they have this element. And so God gives them grace even in their last breath. This is their last breath. <sighs> is their first breath in celestial air. <sighs> and so we're not afraid of death. We're not afraid of ridicule. We're not afraid of prison. Only thing we're afraid of is failing God. That's it. Amen? But let me say this. Brother Carter, I'm going to pick on you because I have it this week. Okay? But I'm going to now. Okay? All right. So are you saved? Under the blood? Got the Holy Ghost. You hold that. Hold on to that. You now have that element. You have that element now that, that God has given us. Okay? That we talked about resurrection power. You don't have to wait till you're dead. You don't have to wait till you're old. You have it now. If somehow you got in a horrible accident, you passed away. If there was the next level of COVID that the Chinese are shooting at us right now, coming over here, right? Scary stuff, right? But we don't, we don't function the same way. We don't function the same way. Um, if the rapture, the trumpet's going to sound now. You have that element now, right now, that's going to translate you. Now, that's great, because if, if it were tonight, you'd be ready. I mean, you'd be, be pretty pumped. You just heard the word of God. Preacher used you as an example. You got some confidence in Christ, and you're ready to go. But here's the thing. It might not be tomorrow. It might be a week or a year or 20 years from now when we die or when the trumpet sounds. Now, I don't think so. Come on. But we all have that same element if you're saved. And so you have the same experience that Lazarus had. Now, you, you really shouldn't have to go and experience and spit it out of your mouth then. You can spit it out of your mouth now because you realize, I have that now. Jesus preached to Mary and Martha about it. You have it now. You have resurrection power now. You have everlasting life now. It's in you now. How did those boys live the rest of their days? Even in the times of Ahab. I tell you, they lived it like they were ready to take on Ahab themselves as little boys, right? Because I have seen what the reality is. How did Lazarus live the rest of his days? Hey, Jews, you want some condemning evidence? Come on, I'll, I'll give you some. Do you think Lazarus cared one whit what those Jews would do to him? I don't think he cared one whit. He'd been on the other side. You know, in, in Luke, we have, we call it the parable of Lazarus when he goes to uh, uh, hell. But the Bible doesn't say it's a, a parable, actually. I mean, there's kind of the sense that it's true. We'll say, well, Lazarus had sisters. He didn't have five brothers. Well, sometimes the word brother means kin or cousin or half-brother. I tend to believe that this is a real thing. That Lazarus went there and Jesus is using his story. Perhaps. And so after having had that story, how do you think he lived the rest of his days? Do you think that he was at the store and the Spirit moved him to say something about Jesus, but he kind of thought, no, I better not. It wouldn't be appropriate. Huh? You think maybe he had a gospel tract? I don't know what these look like in antiquity. Big scroll, you know, or something. Uh, you think he had one and thought, maybe I should leave it here, but I don't really want to get kicked out of this venue. I, I better not. Or do you think he just, hello? I... I I think he had a whole lot of liberty. I think he had a whole lot of spiritual liberty with resurrection power to think, I think the Lord has given me some liberty to speak on his behalf now. And so, beloved, I wanted to finish this week with something super positive. Because I beat you down and we're living in a beat down world and it seems like it's going to get darker. And we need to strive to have this excellent spirit, but we might yet go to the lion's den. But I want you to know, no matter what happens in the days, week, and months ahead, we have resurrection power. And that should change our lives. I mean, how our lives look. It will make us attractive to some people, like Jesus is attractive to some people. And it'll make us repelling to some people, like Lazarus was repelling to some people. And if you'll take that upon you, know that you have that element in you, then don't let anything make you afraid 
Don't let anything stop you in your efforts, amen, or in your church efforts. You have resurrection power. Can I have my knife back? Thanks, brother. <laughs> okay. All right. Carter, good guy. Good guy. Beloved, I, I wish I could come up with some gimmick that everybody could take and put in their Bible or put in their pocket and, and, and maybe even just religiously, ceremoniously know I, I have this resurrection power in me. But, beloved, it is an invisible thing. It is just a fact and reality that God sees and God knows. But when you're spiritually strong, it's something that you tap into every single day. And it gives you confidence to continue. We've asked you to repent and change and be stirred up this week. And this week, I'm just asking you to hold up your spiritual arms and say, Lord, thank you for this resurrection power. Now help me to go live in it. Both attractive and repelling, but help me to live with resurrection power. Lord God, we love you. I thank you so much for the opportunity to be in these dear, this uh, dear church with brothers and sisters, easy to love. And uh, Lord, we've, we've enjoyed having your presence and hearing your voice. Lord, you've challenged us and you've encouraged us. We thank you that we, we have salvation. Lord, we know we're going to heaven when we die, but Lord, we know that the trumpet's going to sound soon. So Father, no matter what the difficulties is like Paul we pray that we may know you in the power of your resurrection and even in the midst of the fellowship of your sufferings Lord I know right now I'm everlasting uh, Lord that that gives me great boldness it gives me great encouragements no matter what things I'm facing and I know the folks here today probably have some challenges in their life I pray that resurrection power would encourage them and help them through that challenge even tonight we love you and we praise you and we ask this in Christ's name Amen. Thank you, preacher. I'd like you to join me in standing with heads bowed and eyes closed. We'll take just a moment. The piano is going to begin playing. And, uh, it's very simple, as Dr. Levesque said, as the piano plays and you and I spend a few moments reflecting and meditating upon what we heard tonight. We ought to start with a simple prayer of gratitude. My Father, thank you for making all things new, for giving me resurrection power. Thank you that even now I have everlasting life. That everything's different. I'm a new creature in Christ. So let's just start with thanking him. And then as we were encouraged, then shall we ask the Holy Spirit to help us every day to live in that power. To guide us and direct us. I sure am thankful that when Jesus Christ, the light of the world, was taken back to heaven, he left us the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. So he'll do that this week. He'll help you and I to live in resurrection power. So let's ask him to do so, even now. Amen. You may look up this way. Thank you, Dr. Levesque, and uh, appreciate all the messages this week. I'm sure, like me, that you have had your toes stepped on, your heart encouraged, and your head full of information and challenge and encouragement from God's Word. And so I hope we'll take it. 
live it out and appreciate all that we've heard and now keep going forward in this battle that is the Christian life. We'll return once more in time. We'll sing together our uh, chorus for him for the conference, Sound the Battle Cry, in number 413 as we get uh, as our song of dismissal here. Encourage us. Look forward to seeing you back on Sunday. Excited about what the Lord has in store as we gather back to worship him. Let me also encourage you, obviously, stop by. Thank the Levesque for their ministry this week and uh, uh, just be much in prayer for them. God will continue to bless them and use them in the days ahead. Appreciate you being here. Let's grab our hymn book and we'll sing together. Brother Dave comes to lead us and sound the battle cry. 